Hey everyone and welcome to Almost Cancelled, I am Peter and I am going to be talking about Big Little Lies Season 1 Episode 4, it is called Push Comes to Shove. So, full spoilers for the episode as always. And I, I think what's notable to me, at least what sticks out about the, the episode here, is a couple of key scenes. Not, not that the rest of it is not important because it is, but there's a couple of key scenes that really stick out to me. And the main one is absolutely the the... the well, not the hearing, but the, the meeting with the mayor, where Celeste comes in and working kind of as a lawyer uh, on behalf of Madeline to argue for this play. And, you know, she, she's, she's got a nice fancy suit on, she looks really good, she's looking really confident, and she comes in, Renata's sitting across the table, Madeline's there, the mayor, you know, keeps saying, well, there's effort in the, the play, so, you know, whatever, uh, can't be doing it. And Renata gives, gives this speech about being a mom and about what's suitable for children, about bringing people together and blah, 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 blah. And I think what's notable to me is that Madeline tries a couple of times to kind of win the argument. She tries to like say something to the mayor and it kind of like blows back in her face every time. And then Celeste then tackles it uh, with much more confidence and with much more sort of foresight, essentially. And holds a ground better but then ultimately at the end of the scene actually turns it around and talks about how legally they've already lost and here's why and here's why you shouldn't this will be seen as 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 you know blocking free speech the first amendment and and so on and so on and she starts really laying it on to the point where they can't really argue with her anymore and uh i, I do love actually renata's fake laugh she does this fake laugh a couple of times when <laughs> when the mayor uh keeps swearing she keeps doing this fake laugh and, you know, it just does this hard cut after she's made her final point to the, the car where uh, Madeline and Celeste are there and Madeline just can't shut up about how amazing she was and how confident she was and how by the end of the meeting Renata was uh, even agreeing with them because she, she, she just walked in and just wiped the floor with them. And what was interesting to me is that we find out that, you know, they've known each other for four years. Uh, Madeline has never seen Celeste in this setting. She's never actually seen her do her job and uh, use her skills. So this was really kind of new to her and exciting to her. And this this scene is largely kind of Celeste admitting that she loved doing it, that she felt good uh, being in a professional capacity again, and that being a mother and a stay-at-home mom isn't enough. And she feels horrible for saying that. She says, you know, I feel like I've just said something horrible. And Madeline assures her that she hasn't, that she, you know, felt like she needed to do something. That's why she started doing theatre stuff. That's why she's been doing this and that. Um, and, you know, we've spoken about Madeline's kind of regrets about, you know, who she is via circumstance versus who she might have been uh, without those circumstances. And so it's a big scene for Celeste, and it's really big in the context of everything else her plot in the episode goes through. So the, so the actual scene, the meeting scene itself is fantastic, and it's really exciting to watch. And it really is, she is a tour de force in that scene. And I'm not, I mean... Nicole Kidman's very good in the scene. She, she's great throughout the whole episode in the series so far, but I mean the character herself is a tour de force and that basically they don't stand a chance because she's good at what she does. And we see her inner element. It's, it's you know, it's kind of like, um, <laughs> you know, I've not seen John Wick 3 yet, but John Wick 3 just came out and I'm, I'm almost thinking, you know, in the first John Wick movie when he's like, you know, I'm thinking I'm back. Like, that moment. Like, it kind of feels like that. It's, it's the, she's the lawyer coming out of retirement and realising that she's still the best at what she does kind of thing. It has that kind of feeling to it. Uh, but the context around this, which makes it really kind of awkward, is uh, before this scene, before these scenes play out, we have a scene with uh, Perry, who at this point I, I just hate as a person. Like he's just he's awful. Uh, he he is the worst thing ever. And he walks in and she's sitting. She's on the phone to Madeline. She's talking about okay, tomorrow we'll meet at the you know the cafe or whatever, and we'll 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 brief before we go in and you know go to the meeting. And Perry's like briefing, and starts asking her about what she's doing. And you immediately get that he's not happy about this. You, you you get that he's not happy that she is doing something independent from him, that she is considering anything that might lead to her working again and not just being the stay-at-home mom that he thinks she should be. And she says, no, hey, it's just this one-time thing. It's, you know, it's, it's this. And he immediately says, uh, why didn't we talk about this? And he's been out of line every time he said that in this show. I want to make that clear before I say what I'm about to say. He has been out of line every time. 
But at least when he said it about his children, there's at least some minor kind of logic to why he thinks he should, you know, because every time he's asked it, it's been something that, well, I didn't talk to you about it because it didn't seem like a big deal. And that's a perfectly valid answer to that question. But at least you understand why, on some level, he feels he should be, you know, conferred with when it comes to his children. This time is by far the worst time he said that line. Why didn't we talk about this? Because, quite frankly, he doesn't really have a say <laughs> if she chooses to do something on her own. Uh, like her doing this is 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 completely her choice. Obviously, it's it's a personal choice for something. It's not affecting anything in his life. You know, not not really. So. It's her choice, it's a personal choice, and it really, like, if you didn't hate him already before that line, I really started to get pretty angry with him. And, you know, I, I, it, it kind of heats up, and she even turns and says, are you going to hit me now? And he's like, do you want me to hit you? And he kind of walks out in, a, in a, a bad mood, but he's, you know, he's in the, the big closet, and he's looking at things, and he opens this, uh, you know, a, a suit, it's like a, you know, a suit that's been dry cleaned or whatever, and uh, it's, it's, it's her suit, it's Celeste's suit for the next day, and it's this business suit. And he just looks pissed about it. Um, that this is a guy who who wants her to have no power or independence. This is a guy who wants to be in charge and feel like he's the powerful one at all times. That's what he wants. He will never say that. Maybe he will say that. I mean, he surprised me before with what he said, but that is what he wants. And it makes the scenes with him great in terms of TV to watch, but really infuriating uh, if you have any kind of... Uh, well, soul, I guess, <laughs> I suppose, <laughs> to put it right. Because uh, that's made me angry. H him saying, why didn't we talk about this? I'm like, why does she have to talk to you about that? About her wanting to do a friend a favor that's ca that, that sure might lead to her going back to work. And I, 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 I don't know. It, it really upset me. Um, I think any logical thinking human being will, will see it that way, but um, it upset me. And then... You know, so so they go in, and then after they've had their successful thing, and they have this conversation in the car where she admits that she wants, and you know, she loves her kids, but she wants more than that. Uh, you know, that's not enough for her. That's not enough to fulfill her uh, as a person. Which, you know, is is you know, it's a moment of honesty in this show where arguably a big theme of this show is just how how dishonest everyone is with themselves, and this is a moment where some honesty actually comes out. And it's it's it feels very real because of that, and it feels like a big beat in our character arc. And after this, you know, they're back at back at um, uh, Celeste's place out in the out in the the balcony, and they're they're having drinks and they're talking. Now, some time has passed between this scene at Celeste's house uh, because Madeline has went to see the theater director, which is the subject of this scene largely, uh, because we we see Madeline go to the theater director and talk to him. And they're just kind of like, you know, gushing about they're happy about this assorted. Madeline's kind of uh, overly confident that they, they won't ever go to court. Like, no, it's a done deal. Celeste has sorted it. She's my best friend. She's, you know, done this because I asked her for free. It's the whole thing. And he goes in for a kiss. And it does this really smart cutaway. Uh, just as they're about to, you know, meet, lips are about to meet. It cuts to them talking on the, on the balcony at her house with drinks. And... You know, it's Celeste's reaction and like sort of laughing and going, "Oh my God, what happened?" And this might be the funniest scene that they've had in this show uh, for for a number of reasons. One is just Celeste's reactions to everything, but it's also again, it's the honesty and dishonesty of everything that's happening. Where you know, she she says he forced himself upon me, and then you know, or, or sorry, Celeste says, "Oh, he forced him, he forced himself on you," and Madeline goes. Eh, you know, kind of shakes her hand a little bit, and then it cuts to them actually kissing, and Madeline's like kissing back and got her hands around his head, and it's it's a really funny scene because she keeps kind of like downplaying what it was, but kind of emitting little parts like, oh, maybe I touched his butt, maybe I did this, maybe I did that, and like, no, this is shocking. He was like, he he forced himself on me. Okay, maybe force is the not the right word, but it's very it's a very amusing scene, and it they play off well uh, with each other uh, quite quite well, and. But later on, we also find out that this is actually not the first time that they they have had uh, an affair of sorts about a year ago uh, when he comes to talk to her and he hasn't, she doesn't want to talk about it. She says, no, that never happened. We've erased that from the history books. I'm a happily married woman, and he's like, I, I don't really believe you, and I don't I don't agree that there's nothing here. Uh, but she doesn't want it. So 
So yeah, we actually found out that Madeline had an affair in the past, like recently in the past, uh, with this theatre director. And I think it's another sign that she's so dissatisfied with her life and everything that's going on in it. And this is something that's separate from everything else in her life. And this, you know, the, she, she even, you know, going back to that scene in the car where she talks to Celeste about doing the theatre stuff because she needs something more than what she had at home. That's the kind of idea that that represents her independence is the theatre stuff. So someone from that theatre world is where she kind of had some passion with and, you know, that that became something that she's kind of trying to like resist and deny now and sort of move on from. But to go back to Celeste, because during this scene, Perry like comes home and he sees them sitting there and they're, they're laughing with each other. And Celeste is laughing nonstop basically because of this story. And her laughter's pretty infectious. Uh, but he comes in, and this is actually, like, one of the f- first... T- this may be the very first time, if not... If it's not the first time, it's the, the first proper, like, extended scene where we've had Perry with Madeline there, or even anyone, like, any of the other mothers, or any, uh, anyone else, really. And I began to feel very uncomfortable. I was very worried about what he might do in Madeline's presence, that he might say or do something that would give something away about what they're really like, and this would this would be like Madeline witnessing part of that. Uh, and he tries to like sort of stay to almost police the conversation, and Celeste is almost like saved by her kids, where the kids like insist that he come and see something, some slides or whatever, and they drag him away, and he, he just plays it off as a nice thing, and he's like, okay, I'll go with the kids. And Madeline even comments that he's a good dad, that he's a nice dad, and you feel a little bit sick because you're like, nah, he wanted to stay and like monitor this conversation. He wanted to be there to make sure that nothing was being said he didn't want and to get, you know, in front of anything that Madeline might try and talk her into. Uh, when she's already had that conversation in the car. And, you know, she, she clearly, Celeste wants to work again. She wants to be this again. She wants to feel this sense of independence and power again, which is the exact thing that, that Perry doesn't want. He doesn't want that. Uh, that makes him feel inadequate, inadequate for you know some toxic masculinity bullshit reason. And this, you know, finally we do. There is a moment of violence between them where she's put on a uh, you know a very nice outfit again. Not not a suit, but like a very nice kind of very work friendly outfit. And he's commenting how nice she looks. It's all very sweet. But you know it's going to turn. It's going to turn. And he asks why she's wearing that and he's like, oh, there's a meeting following up with the, the thing from yesterday. Uh, you know, it sh- shouldn't be a big deal. And he's like, wait, so th- this will definitely be over after this? And he's looking very pissed off at this point. And she says, well, probably there's a chance it could go to court, but if it does go to court, it'll be like a, you know, it's, a, it's an easy win. Like, it'll be over quickly. Uh, and he's like, oh, so court time now. And then he spins it as, you lied to me. You said yesterday this was one meeting, and now it might be more than that. And when the fight kind of starts, he just grabs her neck. With both hands, might I add. He's got one hand behind her neck, one hand in front of her neck, and it's very violent. And once again, she's saved by a, a child. Like, you know, one of their sons sort of shouts, Mom, where are you? And, sort of, and because they know he's coming into the room, he separates from her, and they pretend that everything's okay, and she leaves. And then... So, and he he's very angry, he's like, you know, he's, he's not punching the wall, but he's kind of like digging his fist into the wall after this. And Celeste goes to the therapist again, on her own, to, to talk about uh, how to like communicate with him that she wants to go back to work, uh, that he might not take it very well, that he might see it as rejection. And the therapist is seeing right through this, because she says, you know, why are you scared to tell him this? Why are you afraid? And Celeste tries to say she's not afraid, but it's clear she is. And the therapist isn't buying it for a second. Like, you can see right through it. And the acting's phenomenal. This is what, you know, the acting's really good here because she's lying. We can tell she's lying, and it feels like a natural lie. Uh, like, it's very good because of that. Like, that's one of the reasons why the performances work so well in this show, particularly from Kidman. And, like, and it goes back again to, like, you know, not, not that she did lie, but, you know, why why didn't she offer up the possibility the first time he asked about it that it could become, you know, okay, it may, it may be like a full case to an extent where there's going to be like a few dates and a few, maybe a court thing. It comes down to fear. She she, she sugarcoated it as much as she possibly could because she she felt like she knew how he would react. She she, she had that sense uh, just because of how he is. Um, and 
I, f- I feel like you know admitting that she wants more than just being a stay-at-home mom is is step number one i feel like again i said this last review i think but i think the final step has to be whatever culmination and the separation or, or whatever from from perry is going to be um so no i yes <laughs> there's there i mean their plot is maybe the best thing in the show because it's so well acted and because it's it's so it's so full of well-constructed character beats and moments where you know what they're thinking uh both good and bad like you know what she's afraid of you know what he might be capable of doing in a scene you always get it uh and it always comes across you, you never feel like oh where could this scene go you kind of have that feeling in the pit of your stomach in the best possible way in the sense that it's intentional in the sense that you know it's building to something and you know what he's capable of and you you know that she's denying it you know that she's kind of sugarcoating it and she's she's doing what she can to not admit that what, what she's in or what she's doing but you're sympathetic with her because you understand why you understand why she's scared why she doesn't want to accept that this is what's happening very good very very good uh, and i'd probably dump it in madeline because we kind of touched upon some of her stuff anyway you know abby leaves at the start of the episode so she's you know down about that of course and uh th- this whole affair that we find out about yeah uh, the other big thing though is that she actually tracks down uh uh ziggy's father uh, jane's rapist where, where she assumes that he used the, re- the real first name and kind of like you know it, like he said it was an architect so maybe it's something like an architect and she kind of finds him online uh basically she has some detective work and you know I, I think this is another case of her clearly overstepping and motivated largely because jane actually says she's thinking of moving back home with ziggy because he, he doesn't seem to like it here and it's almost like she wants jane to stay so maybe doing this will help jane stay uh and you know she'll form this bond that jane won't, won't want to separate from kind of thing so yeah, I mean that that was Madeline stuff for the most part. Obviously, it spills into Ed uh, and what goes on with them because Ed, Ed goes to see Bonnie because Nathan Elion sees Madeline and suggests and says, "Oh, we should have dinner together." And he admits that it's Bonnie's idea. He actually really kind of opens up in a really aggressive, not aggressive in the same way that Perry's aggressive. It's not, it's not you know you never feel like he's actually a danger to her in the scene or anything like that but he's he's kind of aggressive and he just kind of lets his emotions just flow out and he's just he swears a lot he's like uh you know maybe being married to you and going through all these hoops was an absolute nightmare and maybe i'm doing it again because i care about my wife and you know he kind of lets it lets it all out uh but ed goes to see bonnie when she's doing like a some sort of aerobics class it's like yoga with horse riding <laughs> or something i don't know what she was doing <laughs> um, but she comes out and most of the scene plays in a kind of natural way where ed's there to talk to her about that we should be keeping the peace and he there's even a, like a funny moment where he says maybe don't try and give madeline any advice because like you know like peeling potatoes because there was a joke earlier on where madeline said if she teaches me how to peel a potato i'm gonna you know go for her throat or something like that uh so it's a really good say but he does say one really weird thing he says this really weird thing when Bonnie comes out. He says, you know, I love sweat on a woman or something to that effect. I love a woman who's sweaty. And she kind of looks at him kind of weird and he's like, oh, that was more of a general statement. You know, saying it's not about you specifically. It's just like, but it's a really weird line. It's a really, really weird line. Like he's actually trying to be flirty with his wife's ex-husband's wife. That's a really complicated sentence. See, I had to really think about that there as my cat Garrus is meowing and causing trouble over there. And I'm not going to go and let him out. And the reason why I'm not going to let him out is because he does this. He 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 cries to get let out, and then a second later he'll cry to get back in and he'll be upset the door shut. That is something that he does on a regular basis. So I'm not going to do it. I'm not giving in to the the mad cat's demands. Is basically how I feel. So, um, what was I going to say? <laughs> I was going to say that uh yeah so so this scene with ed is kind of it's a little bit weird and it feels like he's almost tried to again make a power play it's almost like and i don't even like he may be attracted to bonnie uh it certainly would make sense if he is but it may even just be about like him wanting to feel powerful himself and almost like 
because he, he's often had a problem with with Madeline think Madeline thinking of thinking of Nathan and him being on her mind. It's almost like my guess would be that he just wants himself to be on Bonnie's mind to get back at Nathan. And I was on Ed's side when he first complained about this stuff because it was kind of like an unhealthy kind of marriage that your wife's constantly thinking about this this ex husband, but. Him reacting to it now and doing this, I mean, because there's some, some sweet scenes, you know, early on when Madeline comes home and he's dressed as Elvis and they're, he's singing the songs for the for the, the talent show or whatever, the trivia night that they're going to, where they're all dressing up as Elvis and Audrey Hepburn. And it's kind of some sweet moments, but this scene comes down as really weird. And I, I've not decided if he's actually trying to flirt with her in a sense that he actually wants it to go somewhere or if he's flirting with her just because he she wants to be... Th- her to be thinking about him because that'll upset Nathan and in a way it kind of works even though in the scene with Bonnie and Nathan later on Bonnie never actually says that he said anything weird he, she just says the normal parts And but Nathan's really digging Nathan's like did he say anything weird did he say anything out of line did he say anything that would give me a reason to hit him and Nathan's been kind of a dick uh, you know it has to be said Nathan's feeling a bit more like a dick Ed might be more of a dick as well uh given what he's doing uh so no and it's it's funny there's a, there's a lot of people in this episode who are kind of either slightly asshole-ish or slightly dickish um or we learn something about a lot of characters in this episode that make us you know okay all right that's that's a fault it's funny like i said back in the first episode that i, d- I really didn't like madeline as a person although she's a f- entertaining character to watch um, I stand by that, but like I do think she's grown on me a lot over the, the four episodes because she, she is likable in other ways. And seeing her with Celeste in the car after the meeting and seeing how excited she was and how honest she was in that scene, I liked her more. She felt more human. She felt more human. And then you find out she's had an affair and she's trying to cover it up. And you're like, oh, okay, right. So, you know, it makes you like her a little bit less. And then Ed, you think, is actually this fine husband. But then he goes and has this scene with Bonnie. You're like, oh, okay. I don't know. Maybe, maybe he's maybe he's not as perfect as he seemed. And then you have a <laughs> have a scene where Nathan's or two scenes actually with Nathan. One where he's being kind of a dick to Madeline, even though it's a very honest scene again. And then another one where he's with with Bonnie, where he's clearly obsessed with Ed. And it's like, no, no, he's being kind of a dick. So it's it, it's really. I guess I'm saying is that the characters are very complex and they're not necessarily always likable all the time, which I guess makes them feel more realistic. As, as I guess what I'm getting at. Uh, but I did think it was interesting that all that happens over the span of a very uh, quick period in, in one episode. So yeah, um, that, that, was, that was the Ed stuff. Uh, and then just to go back to Jane, obviously, uh, who has a meeting with uh, the teacher from the school because the teacher notices that Amabel is staring at Ziggy and Ziggy's staring at Amabel and she seems upset. So the teacher talks to her and tries to, you know, why are you upset? And then she brings up Ziggy, you know, suspecting that he's the reason. And Amabel says, no, we're friends. We, we play all the time. And she does seem upset when she's saying this, but she she does seem to be, you know, saying all the right things. And the teacher goes to goes to Jane outside of class, out, you know, outside of the school, because so that people won't talk and says, hey, I think Amabel might be getting bullied and Ziggy might have something to do with it just because of the way they're staring at each other, just because of, of the, the, the tension in the room, even though you've not seen anything. And this scene really made me think that none of us have seen anything as the audience we have not seen ziggy do anything yet we we really haven't so we're actually in the dark whether or not he actually is doing this or not like we, we are as in the dark as any of the adults here and but there's a good point here where if, if, if he did do something wouldn't someone see it Would, wouldn't one of the other other kids see it and she gets really upset but she does go to a, a child uh psychologist with him she takes him to a child psychologist and the psychologist is like no I, I don't think he's a bully if anything i think he's being bullied you know he's a sweet kid uh she brings up you know that he's you know because he, he says he's really smart and we've seen that he's really smart for, for for his age and given some of the things that he says he's very observant and he even warns the psychologist like you know if you mention my dad my mom will get this funny look on her face and of course jane does and she doesn't explain what happened but she does admit that he's not a good person and that he's never going to meet him so you got that but so so you've got that where maybe there's some comfort there and it's like there's this worry of like has he inherited violence or tendencies from his from his father but we see jane as much as she, she says earlier on to to madeline 
and she talks about uh you know telling her everything but, but before celeste shows up in the scene she talks about her her past and she says that she's starting to look at men not in a sexual way necessarily but just kind of a, like uh appreciating them in a sense and she like sort of motions to this older guy with tattoos and like yeah he's, yeah, he's kind of whatever um and it's this kind of funny moment um and it's worth mentioning the scene madeline also mentions that she's like oh i'm talking about sex too much yeah yeah but jane thinks like oh you, you're you're worried talking about sex with me because i was raped and i think that that was notable because uh, last episode i i mentioned that i did notice that she never used that word uh, and didn't even use the word sexual assault uh she, she kind of avoided those terms even though what she described was clearly that uh, but she does say it in this episode, which actually in this scene gives more credence to what she then follows up with, because she says that, uh, like, finally saying it out loud and telling someone, like, took away some of the power of it, and it's actually letting me feel better. Now, whenever I actually start thinking about men more than, like, what I am doing, it always ends up leading to thinking about that night, like, it's still this demon in there. But she does actually sound like she's a little bit healthier, uh, and that she's willing to say it, and that the fact that she actually uses the word makes me think that she's a little bit healthier. Of course, over the course of the episode, I start to think that she's maybe, again, this is kind of almost pretending she's better. And not not in the sense that she's trying to lie to Madeline, more that she's trying to lie to herself, that she's trying to convince herself that she is better. Because we see her, you know, running and jogging around and she almost like runs off a cliff. In fact, the final shot of the episode is her running off the cliff. Not that she actually does it. I, I should make that clear. It's more of a, a kind of in her head moment where it's cutting between her running towards the cliff and her listening to music and getting really upset and singing to the music and getting angry. She's sweaty, uh, which means Ed will be into her because Ed loves sweaty women. We've, we've established this. And it ends with this great shot of her actually going to jump over the cliff. Um, really, really cool. Uh, it's a really, really neat moment to end on. But when she finds out, when she sees the guy's face, that, that you know, Madeline thinks she's tracked, tracked him down. Shh, shh, Garris. Garris. All right, I'm gonna let the cat out. He's he's been he's been too much of a a cry baby. All right, if he cries to get back in in a second, I am gonna be livid. All right, um, so, and I just fed him. For anyone who's like, oh, he's probably hungry. No, he just ate. He literally just ate like, you know, right before I started recording. So he's good. <laughs> Wait, what's, I'm getting angry at the cat. Um, yeah, she she. So when she sees this 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 uh, the guy. Uh, the guy's face. She says she thinks it's him. She won't know for sure until he hears his voice. And, you know, I think Celeste says, oh, you're not thinking about going down there, right? Which I guess kind of implies that Celeste seems to know the story as well here. And I think there's a scene with Madeline that implies she knows it as well earlier on. And she, you know, she doesn't say anything, I don't think, or she says no or whatever, but uh, there, there is a quick shot of, you know, there's some like, shots in her head of her firing at her gun. And later on when she's running and we have that quick cutting between the running and the the being back at home and like feeling like she's jumping off the cliff, we see her like fire the gun multiple times, you know, in the firing range, over the bed, in various locations, and every time she's hitting him. And, it, you know, it's like, is she actually considering some form of revenge? Which is obviously an unhealthy tactic to go around, and if she, if she really cares about her son, maybe going to prison for the murder of uh, someone who... What, what, while maybe deserving, uh, still not legal, and it's just I think the editing towards the end of the episode with all these thoughts running through her head, you know, running and like both the mid run before she jumps off the cliff, but not really, and then her arriving home and being sweaty and like listening to the music, all that stuff and the way it cuts around, it does a really good job of kind of presenting what her head's like right now. It does a really good job of showing how splintered her thought processes and how she can't really focus because she's consumed with this the memory of this night um and you know actually actually i mean i, I talked about uh you know celeste wants her power back her independence uh and she kind of in many ways has to take it away from perry again or take it back from perry i should say um jane and kind of in, in, a, in a sense is, is this kind of the same thing where her power was taken away from her that night and she's felt powerless to an extent ever since. And she needs to get her power back. And obviously there's healthier ways to do that. Um, this isn't one of them, what she's thinking about. But it really good, does a good job of showing you sort of what that is in her head. Um, and, you know, and you know, I think Madeline being unhappy, like, it's, it's so much of this. I mean, the, 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 the three leading ladies are clearly the three characters that we're following in this show. And it's really their stories. 
and thematically they all kind of link up in some way. They're all very different versions of feeling like their power isn't there or it isn't what it should be. Uh, and Madeline, I think, is another example of that. And you know, or in her unhappiness in her marriage and trying to pretend it's okay, trying and but she's having affairs, all these things. She's not feeling fulfilled. Um, you know, she even says at one point in this episode she feels that she's she's losing control. Um, and I, I think to an extent she she's felt that way for a long time, and that's why a lot of the things that have happened to her have happened, uh, and why she's the way she is, the way she is. So. Um, that, that the last like minute there was kind of rambled. The cats threw me off, but hopefully, hopefully I made some kind of sense uh, during all that. Yeah, editing was really good towards the end. Uh, really, really good. Seeing the therapist was was great again. This, the the meeting scene was phenomenal, uh, and you know you felt both Celeste or you know maybe not our most powerful, but certainly a glimpse of the power that she had, and Madeline in awe of that power. Uh, was a really big pivotal moment for the show and it, it makes sense that it's halfway through you know this is the middle episode uh this is o- over the hump as they say and I, I think it makes sense that we get to this point and we we're really at the meat of the problems that all these characters have um and it's really the three the three leads um that are that are ground in the whole show so and one thing i'll think actually before i uh I go um i'm a little bit concerned because Something is clearly going on with Amabel. Uh, just, you know, before, I almost forgot to talk about this, but, because uh, I, I spoke about Ziggy going to therapy and whatnot, but, like, there is something clearly happening with Annabelle, Amabel, and Ziggy might be involved in some way. I'm a little concerned that Amabel is being bullied in some way or assaulted in some way, but I'm, I'm starting to think it isn't a kid that's doing it. I'm I'm a little bit concerned that it's actually an adult that's that's behind this, and my only real feeling for this is that you know Ziggy is seeming less and less like a culprit, even though there's all this like circumstantial suspicion to kind of like suggest them. It's starting to feel more and more like that the solution here and why she's so scared of talking it may be because an adult's behind it. So I'm a little concerned we're going to a really dark place uh, in the coming episode. So. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. I bet I wanted to mention that before I wrapped up. Yeah, um, I, I'll leave that there. That's episode four <laughs> of Big Little Lies. Um, you know, uh, we'll, we'll see what episode five brings. Let me know what you thought of episode four in the comments below. You can like and subscribe, all that stuff. Get us on the Twitters at mailed underscore fuzz for channel updates. Uh, if you want to support the show and the channel and everything we do here, head over to patreon.com slash TV. We can support us for as little as a dollar per month. And you can get bonuses, exclusive, some early stuff, all that kind of thing. Uh, as far as promoting other content goes, uh, obviously, uh, right now, um, I'm reviewing Chernobyl, which is a HBO miniseries, uh, which started off with Connor, although uh, the rest of it will be with Tara. So you can check out that if you're interested in that. Um, obviously, I'm doing season two when, when this hits, obviously, uh, once I'm done with season one, uh, on a weekly basis. And then, is there any TV shows that are kind of relevant? Obviously, I reviewed Sharp Objects. I'm sure I said that back in the first episode review, but if you want to go back and see that which again started with connor and then became just me uh, after three or four episodes because <laughs> uh, he wasn't really into it uh but yeah that is uh that's me so thank you once again for watching or listening i always appreciate it keep watching tv guys have you got any vanilla <laughs>